Well, hello everyone and welcome to our 2021 prep series. This series of interviews features our 2021 Inner Circle Astrologer Guides and is dedicated to helping you understand the cosmic energies of the upcoming year so you can prepare, plan, and get ready for what's to come. We also love to introduce our 2021 Inner Circle Astrologers to our existing members and to those of you who are considering, considering joining our monthly membership community this December when we officially open doors. And today we're featuring astrologer Frank Clifford, and we're going to be focusing on how 2021, from his perspective, is going to be bringing a breath of fresh air. And before we dive in, I wanted to invite you to the free annual kickoff event for our inner circle, which is happening December 10th and 11th. And it's two days of panels featuring the 13 astrologers that will be taking us through 2021, Frank being one of them. So if you would like to join us for that panel event, that is happening again, December 10th and 11th. You can go to astrologyhub.com slash 2021. Again, that's astrologyhub.com slash 2021. Reserve your free spot. We will be talking all things 2021, asking some key questions. I love, love, love the engagement between the astrologers and you'll get to learn from all of them at once. So Frank, it is such a pleasure to have you here. You were featured in Astrology Hub's second ever event, which was in 2016. Yeah. It's been, it's been a long time. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Hi. And we've been, we've been wanting to have you back ever since. So I'm so happy that you're here with us today. And I'm here in a different setting for those of you who are used to seeing me in a different place. We're actually doing 2021 planning for Astrology Hub. So this is perfect timing. We'd love to get your astrological input for the different kinds of waves we're going to be riding next year. And I know everyone's eager to hear from you on this. So let's start with the theme. What would you say the theme for 2021 is from an astrological? Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Let's go before that. Let's start with your story because you're new to this community. So can you tell us how you came to practice astrology and specifically the type of astrology that you practice today as well? Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Yes. Well, uh, it was about 30, 31 years ago, I went to see an astrologer in London called Tad Mann, who uh, some of you will know of. And I was 16 years old. It was a full moon in August. And I uh, just got the astrology bug from having my chart done. Tad does astrology in a very different way from a lot of people. So it wasn't the conventional uh, route into into learning astrology but then again I, I don't really follow conventional roots into anything so I came home that afternoon and started teaching myself the symbols and like most people astrology became uh, an obsession and as we know with astrology you never stop learning I'm always interested in reading what people have to say listening to people's talks and just bringing more into into my experience. So it's been an interesting ride. I, I've spent my 20s head down, teaching myself, researching. I did a, a data book um, and I worked with Lois Rodden, who was a data collector and astrologer back in the, in the 90s through then. And then really started to find my voice. I was absolutely terrified of speaking to a crowd or getting up and asking questions, doing anything like that. And by 29 at my Saturn return, somebody pushed me on stage and I thought, if my mouth opens and something comes out, then I guess I'm gonna be a, a teacher. I'm gonna be a, 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 a lecturer. So I've, yeah, I've had great fun ever since and I was, I was saying to, um, to Jamie just now, really, that the, um, the key is that if you love what you do, and as an astrologer, you've got to be versatile. You've got to um, uh, write, consult, keep learning, uh, do 101 different things. And um, it's kept me very busy. And I always say I've never had a real job. I've just been an astrologer all my life and professionally from about the age of 21. So it's been a full time um, job and it's such a labor of love so it's great talking to you and it's great always talking astrology to people wow so tad was an inner circle guide a couple years ago oh, okay yes and um what did you think that you wanted to be before you found astrology 
I wanted to be a teacher and it only occurred to me just a few years ago that in fact I am a teacher. I've been yes, teaching. Isn't it strange? <laughs> I mean, I run a school. I have a school in China now and Japan and, and Turkey were setting it up. And I run my own school and I do hundreds of talks every year, I probably a couple of hundred a year. And it wasn't until recently I thought, oh yeah, I always wanted to be a teacher and now I am. But to me, it's just the whole umbrella of astrology. So before then it was teaching and it still is. And at one point I wanted to go into film and TV. That was my degree. I did a media degree. Well, you kind of are doing that now too. In your, I mean, look at what yeah. we're doing right now. Yeah, I didn't like, I went to university and did a media degree and I thought, you know what, I don't, everybody's stepping on each other for no reason. Yeah. It's all mm -hmm. inconsequential. And I sat there and I continued to learn astrology and palmistry all throughout my years there. Um, learned as much as I could, soaked up as much information and experience. And, and then I've been running ever since with it. But yeah, media didn't appeal to me after doing the degree. <laughs> right. And uh, one more question before we go to 2021. What, what brought you to your first reading? Like what was happening in your life that made you want to have a reading? Well, my mother used to love to visit fortune tellers. And she went to a psychic who recommended Tad, uh, and it was just that. I thought I'd come along too, and we sat there and had readings one after the other in August 1989, all those years ago. I think 89 was a very big year for astrology generally, if you look back, mm -hmm. and it really um, was the seed for so many people. And nowadays I'm teaching a lot of people who were born in 1989 or the early 90s. Um, wow. And even teaching people born in the year 2000, 2002. And I want to say to them, that's not a year of birth. That's a year of my life. <laughs> so, wow. But uh, yes, so um, I guess um, what brought me there was it was just a curiosity. And uh, curious, I've been reading Linda Goodman's Sun Signs, as many people had, um, fascinated with what it said I could be. And uh, yes, it's been a, a wild journey of self-understanding since then. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to 2021, the theme. As the Maui trade winds are picking up here and the winds are blowing, let's talk about this breath of fresh air idea. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, the if we look at what's been going on in 2020, and I'm sure the Astrology Hub uh, regulars will have heard a lot of different perspectives on that. Um, all, most of the planets, the outer planets, uh, apart from Neptune, have been in, the social and outer planets have been in Earth, the signs of Capricorn or Taurus, um, nothing in Virgo, but uh, those two. And it's been a very heavy Earth-based year of 2020. And in many ways, that's great because we've managed to reconnect with routine, with a sense of, even if it's been unstable times, a sense of where we find ourselves in these un uncertain times. But the year ends with this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in the sign of Aquarius, zero degrees, and zero degrees of any sign is really the textbook definition of that sign. Uh, it's like a planet moves into that sign and there's a real sense of, okay, I'm gonna do everything I know about Aquarius and it will be innovative, it will be humanitarian, independent, new perspectives, uh, and that conjunction happening at the beginning of Aquarius feels like it's really the beginning of 2021, even though it happens about 10 days before we start the year. So to me, Aquarius being an air sign as well says that's really the sense of, in some ways, being able to breathe out again after the tension of this year. And one of the things we've learned this year with the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in, in Capricorn is we've learned what is negotiable and what isn't. And it's that, that famous uh, prayer to know um, what you can change and to know what you can't and have the wisdom, you know, to know which one is which, to know the difference. Uh, the serenity prayer as it's often called. And while I was researching the year ahead, I found this wonderful quote uh, from Angela Davis, who is an Aquarian um, herself. And she said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. And I think that's such a great quote for the year ahead, because Aquarius is about thinking outside the box 
and it's for all of us. All of us are having this same transit in the sky. Of course, depending on your ascendant, depending on the rest of your chart, we'll have it in different areas of our chart. We'll be talking to different parts of our horoscope. But generally speaking, this is going to be a time to try to come back together as a community with a sense of respect for each other's opinions and beliefs. Fingers crossed with that. Um, the very best of Aquarius is all embracing our philosophy and other people's philosophies. The shadow side of Aquarius can be a little bit like this is the only way to do things or um, having favoritism or you're in my group and if you don't agree with me, you're out. Um, we're hoping the very best of Aquarius uh, will come out in the coming year. It's certainly, as I like to consider, it's certainly a transit of an invitation to be the very best we can be. So the very best of Aquarius, you're saying, would be innovative, humanitarianism, um, inclusive. And, and the shadow side would be sort of like the in-group and the out-group or the uh, even further separation between people. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, yes, or in the sense of um, the shadow side of Aquarius can be... Uh, you need to think the way I'm thinking. And if you're not aggressive in that way, I can't talk to you. And yet um, Jupiter and Saturn are two energies in some ways about building social bridges. Uh, Jupiter is expansion and Saturn is construction. So if you imagine that together, we're hoping in some way that this will be a great time where people can come together. We know lots of places have been very divided, almost down the middle, whether that's the US election just recently, or many other places around the world where um, uh, it's so divided at the moment. So the Jupiter Saturn will be an opportunity, I hope, to bring out the very best where we're embracing differences with actually um, Aquarius being an air sign. It's all about an, a level of detachment in a good sense where we can step back and actually start to see the bigger picture. Instead of What's been happening, I think, for a long time is that people have been getting so wrapped up in the emotion of an experience, um, so angry at that politician or angry at the state or angry at something else or angry at an ideology. They've forgot that they can individually focus on a solution. And the Aquarian energy, the principles behind Aquarius is step back, see where people are coming from. It may not be where you want to go, but allow other people and respect other people's choices. And I always think, you know, in terms of social constructs and Aquarius is very much about social responsibility. We're um, all invited in many ways to look at how we are responsible for ourselves. And if we all pay attention to that, we don't have to worry about who's doing what next door in the country next to us or what's happening. You know, I mean, of course, it's important to stand up for our rights in a community that's part of the Aquarian experience. But I think what 2020 is telling us is to come back and focus on who we are, how we individually respond. And if we think about the word responsibility, I'm sure people have said this many times in Astrology Hub, but it is about the ability to respond, responsibility. And so to me, that's really what the defining moment of 2020 coming in to 2021 is, is going to be about. And Frank, do you see a shift towards more focus on local community or do you see it more of a, of a global shift? Or both? I hope it's both. I mean, it really does start individually. Uh, you'll see in the coming year with Saturn and Uranus at odds with each other, the planet of, of um, foundation, uh, responsibility, Saturn, the old, the tried and tested, is having a standoff three times in 2021 with the planet Uranus, all about rebellion, breaking free, breaking the mold. So we'll see it outside, we'll see it politically, we'll see it in many, many different ways. But always, I think, change starts from within. And any invitation out there, anything that we see, is an invitation not to get wrapped up in being 
angry at the news or angry at the things that we can't necessarily automatically change. It's getting us, bringing us back to, to the center of who we are and then making that um, responsible choice for ourselves. So I think it's on all levels. We can see it out there, but let's not get um, carried away or completely uh, overwhelmed by the social aspect of it and bring it back to how we can learn from this individually, socially, locally, and with friends and family. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, how important it is to be putting our energy into the, the structures that we want to see flourish and we want to see um, thrive. And for so many people right now, that a lot of that includes their local communities and really um, circulating or, or making deposits. I like to think it's like, it's almost making deposits in the places that you want to see growing through this time. And it's never been more apparent how important that is to do, for, at least for me. I, know, I think a lot of people have been aware of that for a long time, but all of a sudden it's really clear that if we want to see these, these you know, small local businesses stay around or, or the different kind of, you know, our farmer's markets. And if we want to see more of that, that we actually have to circulate some of our energy and resources in that direction. Absolutely. And it's staying in contact and understanding what other people are needing right now, staying in the moment, not getting swept up. And I know it's been a really difficult year for a number of people. And we've had, I think everybody's been touched by it through loss of some kind. And the Saturn Pluto that's really defined and molded 2020 uh, is, um, in you know, it's a conjunction. And the conjunction is always the symbol of the end of a cycle and the beginning, the seeding of a new cycle. So I look at it and I think actually so many aspects of what we might, might have considered as establishment or a sense of the patriarchy in some way are being slowly broken down and transformed. We know that with Pluto in Capricorn anyway, 2008 all the way up to 2023, 24. That, but this year has been the peak of it with Saturn joining Pluto. And my feeling about that is, and I've been saying this uh, uh, for a while now, I guess for most of this year, although this year seems to have gone very quickly in some ways, uh, and yet it's endless in others. Uh, the, um, you know, Capricorn is a feminine sign. And I know nowadays in terms of um, how people want to define the signs uh, and we're no longer so simply um, uh, one way or the other, you know, we're, we're moving towards a, an exclusive, um, an inclusivity of many things. Um, but Saturn traditionally is a feminine sign. It's a, um, you could think of it as uh, night as opposed to day, however you want to classify it. And I think the Saturn Pluto really began with the burning of Notre Dame in Paris. And we're seeing the deconstruction of a lot of old establishments in many ways. And we're seeing, I think, the re rebirth of the feminine energy in all of us. Uh, so we'll see feminine leadership come to the fore um, very, very strongly with that. And um, really the Saturn Pluto is the non-negotiable demolition of uh, politically, socially, the patriarchy. And it's really the peak it's sort of every, it's um, Saturn Pluto is often uh, an aspect linked to the, <clears throat> to the aftermath of something. And really the Saturn Pluto, I think is the culmination or the aftermath of the Time's Up, the Me Too movement. And all of a sudden this is gonna be a seed and Saturn Pluto is a, uh, you know, is a, is a long, is a 30, 37 year, I think um, um, aspect. Uh, uh, depending, it can, it can depend on um, how fast Pluto's going, of course. But it's uh, it's a classic time to rethink um, the sign of Capricorn. And Saturn is a quote unquote feminine planet. Um, Capricorn is a feminine sign as well. So it's the beginning of a, a feminine leadership in us all. So we can be, uh, we should be listening to the the feminine in us all at the moment, I think. That's really interesting, Frank. I think part of that's going to be actually exploring and defining what that is, 
and maybe defining is actually not even the right word to use when it comes to the feminine principle, but you know, it's not just female, obviously, yeah. because a lot of females lead in a very masculine way as well. So it's, it's what does feminine leadership actually look like? How does it move? What does it do? Um, and that to me is a very exciting exploration, I think for us all to, to come into balance in that, that realm of leadership. So Frank, you've mentioned a few times the Saturn Uranus squares that are happening next year. Yes. Do you want to go into those a little bit more in terms of key transits that you have your eyes on? And yes. then also what else besides yes. that? Yes. Okay. Well, that's the, the main theme of the year. And it's not surprising. Uh, Jupiter will move into Aquarius, by the way, as we said, um, around the 21st of December. And that takes us back to 12 years ago with the beginning of the Obama um, administration as well, where, where it was sold to be hope and looking forward to things. Very Jupiter, all about hope and um, the future, and in Aquarius, that sense of bringing people together. But I think um, whoever whoever's in charge in any different country there's always going to be an awareness of of um uh people have to do it themselves you can't just vote for somebody and they'll do it for you <laughs> and i think that's part of what we're experiencing so we've got the jupiter saturn at the end of december followed by mid-february mid-june and really christmas time around the 24th exactly of of um december we've got these three major Saturn Uranus squares. And to me, it's going to be a response to 2020. It's going to be the further rebellion, the awakening, the restructuring, the breaking down of a lot of the Saturnian structures. So they're very, very different energies, Saturn and Uranus. Um, it could be that people are seeking to liberate themselves in a Uranian way from certain authorities in their lives. Um, to liberate themselves from, uh, uh, you know, uh, breaking with people that they perhaps elevated in the past. Saturn types in society are always the people that are uh, establishment or established, uh, people that we look up to. And the Uranus group are always the people that think differently. They come knocking on the door of the structure and say, we're going to change this whether you like it or not. So there's a big battle happening. Uh, some people have called it the clash of the titans uh, in, um, in the year ahead. And that's a great description for it, because there will be a sense of something has to change. And there'll be, it's interesting, the astrology of Saturn and Uranus, because in some ways, um, Uranus takes Saturn somewhere where it, Saturn has to change, has to get modern in some way, and Uranus will break that off. At the same time, the Saturn-Uranus mythology of castration means that Uranus will also suffer in some way during this battle. So it's not simply that things are going to be reformed. There's going to be a big kickback, I think, from the authorities that have an investment in things staying the same. And Uranus will have to do battle with that all of next year. And it will be, okay, we've got something progressive this week and next week they're undoing or repealing some law that takes away your freedom. And it's gonna have that feeling to it. And again, it's an invitation for all of us to sit back and say, okay, um, which parts of Saturn am I, am I going to keep and embrace in my own life? And which parts of Uranus am I going to wake up and get in full gear so I don't become crusty, set in my ways before, uh, before I'm old? So it's going to be an internal battle, but we'll see it played out on the world stage uh, in many, many different ways. And it'll be challenging on both sides. That's my feeling about it. Mm, I love that. What would you say is the, since Saturn is still going to be a big player for us and we're choosing what parts of Saturn we want to continue um, cultivating in our lives, what would you say the higher invitation of Saturn is? Great question, because my feeling as we're talking to a group of astrologers and whether you've been with Astrology Hub for five minutes or whether you've been an astrologer for years or decades, the 
invitation to see astrology as a language that can help you explain and bring meaning to your life means that you're an astrologer. It doesn't mean for some that you should be doing reading just yet, but it, everybody who's involved in the language of astrology is ready to speak it. And I, I think of them as astrologers. So both Jupiter and Saturn moving into Aquarius, particularly with Saturn, Uranus, um, we're, we're looking at what we can do as astrologers, as a community, Aquarius, of astrologers with the establishment. And it might be, for instance, that there are suggestions of tucking astrology back into uh, fortune telling or areas um, where we, like in England some years ago, astrology became a subject that we could only talk about in the media, in the official media, BBC and everything else, if it was con uh, considered entertainment purposes only. I think that's in New York as well. It's just come to my attention that right. it, there's the disclaimer of like, this is for entertainment purposes only. Yes. Now, <laughs> it it's that's pretty shocking in a sense. Um, on one other level, most astrologers think, okay, if that's what needs to be said, it can be said, and then we can just get on with doing the work that we do well and helping people, um, inspiring people to do things, all of that. Um, but what the invitation of Saturn is, uh, is that we need to, I don't think astrology needs to prove itself to in the world of academia, even though there are people doing that and good on them for doing that, or it doesn't need to prove itself scientifically, because I think the human mind, the human psyche, all the things that astrology can talk about uh, can't be encapsulated or measured or tested in a way. So trying to get that done, that's for some people and good on them, good luck to them if they do that. Um, for me, the key with Saturn and Aquarius is we have to um, maybe forget about some of that or trying to approve ourselves, but we need to align uh, to a, a sense of ethics and often around elections, for instance, um, important events, etc., cetera, um, we get um, all sorts of predictions thrown around about what's going to happen, etc. And really astrology at its very best is not about prediction. It's about helping people navigate the future, bring in what they understand about themselves and understand the season that they're in and make, um, make decisions based on where they want to go and align it with something that uh, works well for them, or the season that they're in, etc. And astrologies, you know, all different types of astrologies are, are geared towards explaining the season that we're in. So next year, we're in a Saturn Uranus season. The invitation is to, to, do, uh, to be part of that. So what I'm particularly conscious of, I think astrology is going to be super geared up in the coming year in terms of news as it has been in the last couple of years and it has been for a long time uh, but particularly we're going to have to be extra vigilant about who we are ethically uh, whether we want to attach ourselves to predictions of public people predictions with personal clients uh, that all of that is going to come up to it and one of the things that gets me and this is not my type of astrology. My, I'm more of a humanist astrology. It comes from within the birth chart as an expression of what you've signed up to do, should you choose to do that, and transits and events and different things happening, again, are invitations to, to accept that, um, that vocation, that calling. But one of the things that I've been battling against for a while uh, are the phrases like debility, detriment, exhortation, or fall, all those traditional terms that people hold on to. And it bothers me because some of those terms are, um, you know, when you're learning and then all of a sudden you read somebody says, oh, my Venus is in debility or I've got a detrimented Mercury. And then, and you've always known that because there's a part of you that doesn't quite feel good enough and all of us feel that we're not good enough at some point and uh, or in some area of our lives. So I think we have a responsibility as astrologers to tear up some of those early ideologies and give people an idea that every placement has a spectrum of possibility. The reason that uh, 
signs are said to be, planets are said to be in detriment of certain signs, comes back to the very simple um, black or white judgments that astrologers made, male astrologers as well, patriarchal male astrologers made many years ago, in terms of um, does, will, if the king goes to war, uh, well, you know, they asked a question, the horary on it, or they elected a time for the king to go to war. And they would elect a planet in its most obvious, purest sense. So it became linked to these very simple black or white judgments about how to use a chart for the king, for the ruler, for the politicians. And we know in an era of psychology, we know in an era of astrology being more human centered and soul-centered, uh, human-focused, that if you've lived long enough, you're going to experience a whole range of possibilities of every placement. There's no good or bad. There are challenges in the chart always, but there are challenges in so-called great placements that you might read about and challenges in so-called tough ones. So part of my job at the moment, I feel, and I think this is part of Saturn in Aquarius, is to be super, super responsible for our words as astrologers, to be extra careful what we say, and also move away from the idea that things are debilitated. Instead, look at how we can help people make the very most of each placement. Because anytime somebody says to me, oh, well, yeah, Venus and Scorpio, that's a bad placement or something ridiculous like that. I want to show them 10 examples of people I know or famous people who have done amazing things with it. And so what I say nowadays to my students, I say the only debility is the astrologer's inability to describe something positive about that placement. So I tear up those um, descriptions. So that to me is what Saturn in Aquarius is saying to me right now, is that I need to be particularly responsible because if people outside of our community start to hear these things, they're gonna think, hang on a minute, are these people in the dark ages? And so that's, that for me is the invitation to be particularly responsible, but for other people, it will have other, um, other invitations. Wow, this is a fascinating exploration that I would love to do more of with you. And yeah. it's partially too, what about the quote unquote old system is worth keeping, right? The sat, what, what are the, what's the gold that's worth threading through while we redefine and start to evolve the way we look at certain placements and certain signs and, and all those things. I love this, what you're pointing out here with Saturn and you, as with, with the Saturn, but then moving into air yeah. is responsibility for words, responsibility for the impact of our words, for the energy behind our words, for the, for the ripple effect that they create. And that seems like a very important and very high invitation for us all as we move into 2021 as well. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. You know, and I've talked to, I talked to a lot of different kinds of astrologers. So you have the ones that still really like to use that, that those traditional words. Um, but there's always the caveat of what they mean by that. They don't mean it's bad, but it's hard when the word itself already carries a negative connotation. It then yes. requires an explanation that, people may or may not be willing to wait around for. They kind of take that, oh, it's bad, and they run with that. It's like the idea of being born with a Mercury retrograde. We hear about Mercury retrograde three, four times a year to back up and to be you know, extra vigilant about not buying mobile cell phones or, or Mercury type things during that period. Um, but being born with it, you then start reading some old texts that talk about uh, just incredibly off-putting ideas. And ah, yes, I, you know, I, of course, part of the Aquarian uh, invitation is to respect other people's viewpoints. It doesn't mean I have to, I'm not going, it doesn't mean I have to teach that way. Yes. And it's important when students come and they say, well, what can I do? Uh, I've got Venus square Saturn or Venus in, in fall or whatever they say. And uh, they need to be educated, I think, to seeing the possibilities there. Because I'm a great believer, there's one great belief I have with astrology, is that we signed up uh, to, to have the chart we have. Uh, and even if we didn't, 
before then, we still have it as we're born. And it's something that we um, want to seek out in people and everything that we do in our lives. And I think this is the first Astro Hub that we spoke about all those years ago, was that it, we, we gravitate towards people and situations that will make us become more of who we were born to be. And so helping somebody articulate a quote unquote debilitated Mercury and then show them half a dozen amazing people with amazing brains who have thought outside the box, done amazing things and say, well, that didn't stop them. Steve Jobs is a great example of a Mercury that would have been thrown away on the scrap heap by people um, because it's practically doing nothing in the chart and it's very widely square Saturn. Uh, and that would have been a no-no. But what we know is that this is a man that had to teach and learn in his own way. He had to uh, do his own thing. So I love the idea of trying to undo some of these things. I wish they didn't have them in the first place. Um, and I respect other people's right to to call them that. As you say, it carries such, ah, such a um, difficulty with it, debility, you know, and we're in a society that really reacts against all sorts of labels. And I've seen students from the very beginning saying, well, I went online in their first class with me, they said, I went online and Mercury retrograde people are supposed to be thick or, oh. uh, or not intelligent. And it, it, I do a lot of um, work undoing those things. Uh, oh. And so that's that's what I feel. But I respect other people to call it. They, they have the right to call it that. I just think if we look at where it came from, it came from a very binary black or white thing of, OK, we're going to war. What's the best sign for Mars to be in? Yeah. What wouldn't I do? Now, I always say to, to people, look at Mars. It's supposed to be at its best in Aries and Scorpio. But the reality is that simply Aries and Scorpio are simply signs that have qualities reminiscent of the of the image and the quality of Mars. And that's why they're called, um, they're ruled by Mars, because they um, when Mars is in those signs, it pretty much does what it says on the tin. Mm. But if I really wanted uh, a war or a dispute to be ended, I'd call in a Mars in Libra considered to be a weak Mars or ineffectual Mars. And you look at somebody like Nelson Mandela, you look at uh, Winston Churchill, even Margaret Thatcher, the people that did very good tactical work during wartime or during oppression in, in Mandela's case, uh, even John Lennon, who went to bed for, for peace uh, and got people aware of that. These are all Mars and Libra people. And I always think if I wanted somebody to throw the first punch, I'd get a Mars in Aries person to do it. If I wanted somebody to secretly annihilate everybody in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, I'd get a Mars in Scorpio to do it. But if I really wanted uh, a, a bridge built between people and a resolution sold where both, both sides feel that they've won, I'd bring a Mars in Libra in. There's nothing weak about Mars in Libra. It's the ultimate tactician, ultimate uh, diplo uh, diplomat. Yeah. Mm. It's recognizing the role for each kind of placement, that there's there's uh, advantages to each placement in different contexts and different situations, just like people shine in different places in different contexts and situations. So brilliant. I love what you're doing. And what you're also doing is bringing story, the story of people's lives to help illustrate what's actually possible with these, again, these weak or detriment or placements. And that's really powerful because people can hold on to that. Um, and that's very Saturnian as well to use the stories. I love that you're doing that. Yeah, and Saturn, of course, at its very best is the planet of experience. Mm. So when students come in, I always say, look, you're gonna be the astrologer that you were born to be along with all the experiences you've had along the way. So you're not, don't, don't bother about trying to emulate anybody else or to be the astrologer that we are as we're teaching you. Be who you are simply because your chart will say that as well, tell you the type of astrology you were born to be. And also your experiences, that Saturn quality of what can I uh, rely on? Saturn's like the spine of the horoscope, the backbone. And so there are lots of things in terms of our morals, our sense of, um, 
steadfastness or, or a sense of grounding uh, that that Saturn speaks about as well. Oh, I'm so happy that you're going to be one of our teachers next year. It's brilliant. I love this. Um, so Frank, before we go to your recommendations for things we can be doing between now and the end of the, the year to really be prepared for the invitations of 2021, can you talk about the mastery class that you're going to be teaching in the inner circle on solar arcs? What are solar arcs? Why would we care? What do they do? Tell us a little bit about them. Okay, great. Well, they're one of my favorite subjects because they're very simple. And I would say, if you can count, you don't have to count that much, but if you can count, you can do solar arcs. So it's looking at your birth chart and counting the degrees between any two placements. And that's the year that, that those two planets manifest in your life in some way. Now, we're used to hearing about transits, of course, and transits are cycles, and they're often short cycles, like the Mars transits two years, the Jupiter is 12 years, Saturn is 29 years. With solar arc, they're part of a much bigger scheme, and it's really about the solar journey, the life journey, and uh, what I'm going to be teaching is how to do them, how to see how simple they are, and what I've noticed over the years, the reason that I go around the world teaching them and I love to teach them uh, and I love working. We'll do this when, uh, when we do the follow-up. I'll be working with anybody that wants to look at their charts. Um, I love looking at them because they're simple, they're easy to see, and they're very reliable of, of the seasons that you're in. And you can look back at somebody's chart and say, ah, you, know, you moved house at 12, didn't you? Or you did this and that. And it's very, very simple to see. Transits... Um, Years ago, I got into solar arts because I'd look at transits in somebody's chart when they had a major change uh, doing my research and learning the craft, and I couldn't see a transit. And then I started to see that solar arcs described these things better. Now, most astrologers, I think in the States, maybe around the world, um, they use transits and secondary progressions. I, as soon as I discover solar arcs and being an Aries as I am, I thought I'd invented them because I just started doing that and starting to see how these things worked. I realized that they've got hundreds of years of, um, of, of astrologers looking at them. But as soon as I did that, I put aside secondary progressions and I no longer use them. I haven't used them for 15, 20 years. So I use solar arcs and I use transits. And my rule of thumb is if a client comes to see me, and what they're describing about their lives can't be seen in both of those. I need to add an extra tool. I'm not doing my job. And yet in the last 25 years, using those uh, transits, first of all, and then later solo arcs and transits, it's always there. And uh, I just find it tremendously reliable. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it's not about predicting the future. It's about helping people navigate it um, to be um, in a way, uh, co-creating, to be actively participating in it. And that's my particular view. You can't stop certain things happening around you. Lockdown, you can't stop uh, life changing, people growing old, people moving away, people dying. Um, the transits and the directions are always an opportunity to understand what it means to you and how you can be learning something meaningful about that. So I love them. Solo arts work exceptionally well. And I'm going to show people how to do them um, and do them just by looking at their birth chart. Uh, computers will do it as well, but you can do it very, very simply. So Frank, what kind of questions do they answer or, or help people navigate? Like what, what, what would someone come to you as a client that would have you look at their solar arcs in their chart? Well, I would look at them for every single client. Uh, always. It's always the one one thing. I print out the chart, I make a list of the transits, and I make a list of the solo arcs. And whatever's going on in their lives, they'll be described usually by both. But if it's a toss up between the two of them, the solo arcs will be describing it better. Anything, anything from moving job, uh, getting more spiritually connected, um, getting married, uh, everything you can think of, everything that anybody goes to see an astrologer about, I'm there with the solo arcs. Uh, and you know, uh, over the years, uh, I've been trying my best to just show people a different um, 
area of forecasting because to me um, secondary progressions always seemed like hard work they were complicated they start doing things to each other as well and it's complicated for a beginner or somebody in their second or third year learning astrology to get their head around it and solo arts are just so simple and yet we astrologers sometimes or we humans try to make things difficult or we think it's not worthwhile unless it's blood, sweat and tears. But solo arcs aren't anything like that and they cover anything that you're doing. So as you can tell, I'm passionate about them. I love talking about them uh, and we'll, we'll have fun with the- um, Oh, great. And you're our, I think you're our first astrologer for 2021 in the inner circle, right? You, you're the I January have, new moon? That's right, I'm the January new moon. Looking forward to that because it's a very powerful new moon. Well, so. and it sounds like we'll just be right on the heels of the Jupiter Saturn conjunction. So we're going to be in this new energy and you'll be our first, the first uh, captain of the ship in January. Yeah. You know, Aries likes to be first. So I did, <laughs> I did write to you and say, if I can be first, I'd like that <laughs> because it's, it's such a great month. And I really, uh, as an Aries, I, you know, it's, we're, we're, Aries is very good at breathing new life into something. So I want to breathe new life into the year of 2021, particularly after the, the difficulties that people have had in 2020. Mm, so full circle to our theme, a breath of fresh air. You're going to be our breath of fresh air in January. So Frank, last question is how can we prepare between now and your, your month in January, essentially, for the changing tides for this new invitation of 2021. Okay. Well, the big thing that's happening, as, as we've been saying, is Jupiter Saturn uh, in um, just before the festivities, Christmas, etc. there, the 21st. Um, uh, so that's focusing on that, focusing on um, personal responsibility. Uh, that's, that's the key always anyway, but also just stepping back a little bit and not getting so emerged in something, as I said earlier, that you can't see the wood for the trees. And I think perspective is going to be the key. Stepping back and saying, okay, this is the way the world is right now. Or this is the way that my world is around me. What do I want to do? How do I want to shift perspective? So I want to say to people, think about ways of just reviewing, as in looking in a new way, um, at an old problem or an old situation. Uh, what's leading up to January is inviting us to think of new solutions and to think of ways that we can be more inviting, more, in more tolerant towards the people around us. Um, and we all have trouble with that, of course. Even the people that say they're the only thing they're intolerant of is intolerance. Well, they're still intolerant about something. Um, so it's really about reaching out. Jupiter's the planet of uh, reaching out, getting a broader sense of what's happening, um, discovering new ways to reconnect. And we've been forced in many ways to mask up or to be separated this year. And Aquarius is inviting us to be more inventive, to get back into, into reconnecting with our community in some way. So whether that's going online and connecting with an astrology community or a community of whatever it is that you love to do in your life. Um, one of the great things I've been noticing already is that when we do uh, Zoom uh, classes, that we, as we've had to do for a lot of this year uh, at my school, we've the support that's written in the chat box Somebody will, I'll bring somebody on, we'll unmute them, we'll have a chat about what's going on in their chart, um, and willingly, of course, only the ones that want to do that. And then there's a tremendous amount of support from the community in the chat box. And sometimes it makes me want to cry, and I'm a bit of an old, old crybaby in that way sometimes, because I get touched very easily by, um, by people reaching out to each other. And I think that's part of what we need to do is to spot the differences, spot the things that we have in common and still connect, reunite regardless of, of those. So that to me is the thing, be aware, try to be as aware as possible of the people around you. That great 
that great saying that, you know, be kind because everybody in some way is facing or fighting a battle. That's one of the things that we could really do with um, the lead up to January with the, with the Jupiter Saturn in Aquarius and understand that we're part of a, a human race. Aquarius is very much about understanding that we're all connected in that way and that, um, uh, that equality for one needs to be equality for everybody. So the human rights situation is going to be fundamental. Before that explodes next year with a lot of um, the Saturn Uranus energies at each other, um, what we can be doing is uh, before then finding avenues of how we can reach out to people who understand where we're coming from and reaching out to people from a good place, a place of um, brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, humanitarian ideal in some way. And I think that's, that would be a great start to the next year. Mm, I love that, Frank. Thank you so much. And I'm right there with you. I often find myself tearing up looking at how people support each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, in these online forums is, you know, perfect strangers from all over the world, but united in our love of astrology. And with this common language that we're using, uh, I, we have we opened up the inner circle to the astrology foundation students Rick Levine's class just ended so we let them have like a four day window to get in now um, so they could be with us for this Scorpio uh, moon cycle and some of the things they're saying in in the group online group is you know it's it's amazing to finally be in a place where I can speak this language with other people who speak it also and the, it's so unifying to be able to do that so I love what you're saying. That's a lot of really practical, tangible things we can walk away with. And I can't wait to reconnect with you December. You must be on the 10th, December 10th for yes. our, our forecast panel. It'll be I you. It's, and about, six, six it's about midnight. Strong. I think midnight in London, something like that is a crazy oh. time. But I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Well, Frank, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us, getting us ready for the end of the year, getting us ready for your month in January. And for those of you who do want to join us for that panel happening the 10th and 11th, it's free. It's at astrologyhub.com 2021. That's astrologyhub.com 2021. We'd love to have you. You'll get to hear from Frank and 12 other astrologers about 2021, what to look for, how to navigate the energies in the most um, useful way and to really use the astrology to inform us and keep us aware of what's happening. But like Frank said, not to remain victims of the energy, but to realize our co-creative power with them and our where is our responsibility and how we respond to the energies. So very excited about this, Frank. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thanks, Amanda. And hi to everybody. And uh, looking forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you. All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of our community. And as always, thank you for making astrology a part of your life. We'll catch you on the next episode.